So <clears throat> let me start by thanking Sagrario for that very flattering introduction. And let me say first that I'm delighted to be in Bilbao at this conference on linguistic diversity. And that I would like to, um, and also in this beautiful country. So I took the day before yesterday off and rented a car and drove through the Basque country. I went to Loyola and to Playa Laga. And you, you should preserve this language if only to make sure that you could preserve this beautiful country. I don't understand Basque, but the country is just gorgeous. Okay. So I want to offer my thanks too to the Royal Academy of the Basque Language for the opportunity to speak and to hear about, and also for the opportunity to hear about current work on Basque and other dialectologies. Let's see. Go on. So my goals in this work are going to be, first I'll say a little bit about my own work in dialectology. So I'm, uh, that's of course going to sound like I'm, I'm simply bragging, but I'm, I'm modest enough to know that most of you will not have read that work. Some of you have, most of you maybe have heard of it and a few of you will have read it. I'll try to tell you a little bit about it. It's going to be focused on methods, okay? And then um, I want to tackle this question of the intellectual ecology of our field um, by looking at application of our methods in other fields, other related fields. So the sense of ecology here is neighborhood. There are neighboring fields that are like dialectology in looking at language similarities. And I've been interested in exploring, uh, okay. I've been interested in exploring the use of those methods in some of those fields and I'll let you know what that looks like. And that's led me to a reflection of where we might position this field um, intellectually. So right now it's mostly viewed as very closely related to sociolinguistics. That's for obvious reasons. We look at geographic variation. Others look at um, uh, social variation, sociolinguistics. But if we look more broadly, we might see more neighbors and more opportunities for uh, collaboration. Okay, so next I want to uh, turn to uh, my, uh, back, my background, that is the, my own work in dialectology. And as I do that, just to show you that again, just so you know where we are in the talk, I'll just warn you that part of this is a review of my work and I will quote G.H. Hardy's wonderful book, A Mathematician's Apology. Hardy once said, it's the first duty of any professor to exaggerate the importance of his own field and to exaggerate the importance of his work within it. So take the rest of, of the first half of my talk, cum grano salis. Okay. Dialectology is the oldest variation, uh, sort of the oldest study of language variation, how it varies and where. And we have an advantage over other sub-disciplines of linguistics, which I'm happy to see I see evidence of here as well. And that is an enormous lay interest in our work. We, it's not just dialectologists that follow what we do, but also the interested public. That's an enormous advantage we have over other sub-disciplines in linguistics where I've occasionally worked, where the, there's a lot of interest, but it's all in col among colleagues. I think this lay interest is a guarantee that there will always be interest in dialectology. That's, that's a very good thing. Okay. Now, of course, we do more than just what the lay people do. The lay people are interested in interesting differences. Why do they say uh, cat here and kitty over there? Okay, and we seek some general, generality in our studies. We want to not just to say there is a difference between here and here, but say what's the entire list of differences and what do they have in common? What's the more abstract characterization? Now, we hope that this will lead to an explanation of why some things vary and others don't. So my own work began in a student seminar where we took a paper that Brett Kessler had just published and tried to replicate it. Something I often did with students and it, it, it led to a modest publication. And of course, as often, once you work on something, you become more and more interested in it. Right? So it was in 1996, was my first time I worked in dialectology. And I'll tell you a little bit about how that seemed. 
Um, the dominant approach in 1995 involved lots of manual labor, very sensitive analysis, and enormous data collection efforts that I still admire to this day. It was non-computational and inexact. That's the dominant approach. A shining exception to this dominant paradigm was the work of Jean Segui in Gascogne, who was frustrated by the noisiness of his data. He suggested that one might begin to see the forest and not just the individual trees if one focused on aggregate differences. So he added up the number of differences between each pair of sites in his data and published a curve which showed a sublinear increase. In other words, not a straight line, but something underneath that. The, di the differences became uh, proportionally smaller as he looked further away. The Austrian Hans Goebel, who I know has also been here as well, followed Segui's idea, but he added clustering to detect groups of sites, that is, dialect areas, which we saw in uh, Sousa's uh, pr presentation this morning, and I think at other times we've seen it as well, I think in uh, Wille Gens, uh, pr presentation. Um, he continued Segui's perspective of viewing the data as categorical, that is either same or different, but he also added an inverse frequency weighting. And, and I've tested that, and empirically it seems right. I, the motivation is a bit difficult, but yeah, it, it seems to work. Now, we in Groningen, and I'll present a list of collaborators later, because I didn't do all this work myself, continued this tradition, okay? And we also reacted critically to Hans Goebbels' position of regarding all multiple responses as confusion. At least this is how he characterized it to me personally, just a mistake. We inve inevitably found multiple responses in our data, which I think are genuine, but even if they weren't, they're in the data. When we look at dialect atlases, multiple responses are part of life. They're just there. Okay, and we enjoyed exchanges on the correct mathematics of the necessary treatment for these with Gotchon Arakocha, a leading Basque dialectologist who I hope to see later today to talk to some more. Now, um, I, I just noted that Segui published a curve showing a sublinear increase in differences with respect to ge geography, that is to distance. At my suggestion, this curve has become known as Segui's curve, I think that's correct. And here are some, um, some curves from other language areas that I've looked at, including Bantu as it's spoken in East Africa, in West Africa, in Gabon, Bulgarian, German, American English, Dutch, and Norwegian. Okay. Okay. But we also saw opportunities to improve dialectology by, have, by introducing a more uh, sensitive measure, and that was one introduced by Vladimir Levenstein in signal processing. That was just to align two sequences and measure their differences by the number of changes necessary, or more exactly, the cost of the changes necessary uh, to transform the one string into another. So we applied this then to phonetic transcriptions. Many often criticize for this because acoustics are, of course, more reliable than, than transcriptions. But lots of our data are, lots of the data is still in the form of transcriptions. Okay. Now, this also led to, gave us a lever to solve two older problems in dialectology. One is, uh, the fact that lots of the differences aren't just categorical, the way that Segui and Goebel had regarded them, but rather they're finer differences. So here are uh, roughly 80 different pronunciations of the pronoun I, that is ich in German. And it's from a dialect atlas of only 200 sites. So having 80 different pronunciations in 200 sites, it's not unusual. <laughs> Dialectologists love phonetic detail and they add it. And it's obvious to the even, well, it's obvious to the trained eye, not to the untrained eye, that some pairs are more similar than others. So we developed this technique in a way that let us get at these finer differences. Okay, how did that help us? Okay, if I go on, uh, then f 
No, sorry, let me go back one. My interpreter should know I'm going back one. Um, this gave us an, a, a way of uh, exploiting more powerful numerical analyses, right? The categorical analyses are limited at some point, or you need a lot of data, one or the other. A second problem that dialectology had was that there, there simply is no simple overlap in maps of individual features. Right? That's something that's often suggested when you look at the popular versions of the maps, but in, if you look in the atlases themselves, there are often, you cannot draw a line that separates all the area of one form from all the sites with another form. There will be little islands left and right of the line. And so we needed, it's a noisy distribution, in other words. This is a picture from Bloomfield's famous book, now 85 years old, summarizing some Dutch dialectology. But it's been known for a long time. You have to do more than just that. So how did we exploit this technique to use it? I try to illustrate it here and again some German work. I'm not going to try to explain all of the different um, in fact, we can't actually read all the different features we have there, do we? We lost some resolution, sorry. But for example, the very top left black and white map, I don't have a stick, do I? But the top left of the, of the, the gray shaded maps is the second sound shift in German, a very famous historical event that you can look at in handbooks. And some of the others involved, for example, this, I'm pretty sure, I, well, I can't read it anymore, is the pronunciation of the initial z sound, as in zona, which we're enjoying so much. It turns out the, the minority pronunciation is the standard, zona. The majority pronunciation is sona. People devoice the initial z. Okay. Um, what we did then was add up all of those differences following Sigi and Goebbels, look at those aggregates, and then apply a, a fairly new statistical technique at the time, it was about 15 or 20 years old, developed by Kruskal and Wish, called multidimensional scaling. And we divided up the sites, in, uh, in, and we placed the sites into a three-dimensional space, gave them coordinates in a three-dimensional space. Right? Then we interpreted those, that space, or those spaces, um, uh, chron chromatically, that is, by color. We assigned the first dimension to red, the second to green and the third to blue for obvious reasons that you who work with computers know about. That's what we can map to easily. And then we colored that map based on how far in that coordinate space uh, the sites were. And I think this is an, an honest view of, of a dialect continuum. Not a perfect continuum, but that's because your researchers and I showed you the rough map, the map for the Sunday supplement, uh, smooth says areas a bit. Okay. I could show you the same sort of map in the Netherlands, and I will just to remind you that in addition to interpreting the data geographically, we can also interpret it linguistically. And that's what these little legends do. I won't attempt to read it here because most of you are not that interested in Dutch with, with uh, of course, esteemed except exceptions. But um, we can interpret the data not only geographically, but also linguistically. And I think that's very important. After all, we are linguists and not geographers, right? We want to know what's going on linguistically. OK, so um, we followed up these original studies with many, many more that I'm not going to try to review for you today. Um, we're going to be asked to contribute papers, and I'll include the references in the paper for this, but you can get an idea of the different sorts of things we've tackled since then. And, uh, but I will go on to one that, because I want to talk a little bit more about sociolinguistics later, and this is something that um, one of my grad students, uh, Therese Leinonen, did on Swedish data. This is a map of Sweden, a very schematic one, where you can see the coast of Finland on the right. Swedish is spoken not only in the main uh, peninsula here, but also all along the coast of Finland. So she has that in her data as well. And she combined, she, I think it's notable for two reasons. She combined acoustic analysis in this, 
So she looked at the formants of, uh, of over, of, I don't know how many tokens, but over a thousand speakers and 20 vowels, so 20,000 different vowels, and then many tokens of each in a, in, a, um, in a sample that had been stratified. So we had older and younger speech speakers. She then did the same multidimensional scaling analysis that I just showed you earlier and put all of the speakers into a single space and separated them only then and put them on different maps. What you're seeing here is a picture of what you all know exists in Europe, that is dialect leveling. The dialect differences that we've been charmed by so much and that we all enjoy studying so much are being lost. I think this is an excellent visualization of that that's also mathematically well-founded. As scientists, we want as well, right? Okay. So, I said, I, I, I wanted to bring this up because I, I think that is a good sociolinguistic application of the techniques we've used in dialectology. The social category here is age, right? It does that. Um, and I, not just in Groningen, but elsewhere, I've had good colleagues, and I, as I said, I, I don't want to go, I don't want to mention every single one of them here. Uh, I'll mention maybe in particular uh, Charlotte Hoskins, who is at the bottom, is Prima Inter Paris, but I'll, and I'll talk about her work a bit later. I'll, I'll mention uh, many of the others as well. Here's a little bit of a diatribe, a thing that I don't have to talk about, but I will because the theoretical linguists especially always tell me, but isn't that just an awful lot of statistics? Do you really believe in statistics? Yes, I do. But anyway, even if I do not, it, they think that it's, it's uh, I'm leaving their work, which is all based on categorical sorts of models, right? And that, that shouldn't be the case because we have good examples of sciences that are categorical at one level and the chemistry, think of chemistry, you all took chemistry in high school, I'm sure you know why H2O can be, can be stable because of the, the electrons that are available for bonding, okay, and why methane for the same reason can be stable, okay. But then when you try to characterize what gases do, when you have millions of molecules, you leave that categorical base completely. It's all done statistically, right? It's all done in what's called statistical thermodynamics. I'm, I'm also like to argue c carefully and closely, so please do not quote me as saying, because statistical thermodynamics is successful, statistical approaches to language variation must be. No, I'm just saying that an objection that a, a good categorical base cannot finally end up being statistically interpreted in, a, in, in an interesting way, that has to be fallacious, that has to be wrong. Okay. Now, let me go on here. I'm not going to give you a, there's lots of open questions that I'll let you look at this and if, I, if, if some of you are interested in these topics and want to talk to me about them, that's great because I'm still interested in them. But I'm not going to present them today because well, I want to talk about this intellectual e ecology that evidently piqued some curiosity. Okay. Um, let's do that. Let's look at dialectologies um, neighbors intellectually, okay? And I'll look, yeah. Oh yeah, so, so some of them I've already um, at least shown you that is some, something about phylogenetic inference and done by Yelena Prokic and one uh, on tra a study on transliteration by Peter Nabende and a study on genetics and culture by Franz Money. Um, but now I'm gonna look into a variety of different fields and where the techniques we've used in dial dialectology have also been used profitably. Right? And I'll, I'll talk about these one after the other, but uh, here's a list of them. And they suggest that our neighbors involve a lot more than just sociolinguistics, although as you'll note, I do list sociolinguistics as well. Um, as modern scientists, I think, um, I personally, but I think lots of my colleagues, I'm sure many of you too, 
are proud not only of being able to understand things better, that's our progress in science, but we sometimes create useful things. And that's a very wonderful thing, I think. So what Peter and the Bende wanted to do, he was a, a PhD student from a third world country where the emphasis is always on applied science. And he uh, tried to apply the techniques we developed to pronunciation similarity to information retrieval for names or names of per persons, places, organizations, um, in languages that don't have Western alphabets. Okay, that's a, that's a hard problem, but uh, he wanted to do that, and it's a practical problem, because when you search for a name like Musharraf, that was the time of when he did his work, you find ver very poor results, right? The, the spelling varies too much. Okay. And what he did was apply this um, edit distance technique in... Uh, not just in Urdu, but also in Chinese and in Russian. And he had, um, he wanted to recognize the, the way that they were transliterated, that is not, um, not simply uh, guessed at uh, in, uh, in other languages. And he had, he never had actually the world's best results, but he was always in the top five or so. This is a very, information retrieval has become a very active field where there are competitions, often involving 20 or 30 parties. And you just never beat Google, frankly. <laughs> They're just always better. <laughs> okay, another nice application, not from my group at all, was from Greg Kondrak and Bonnie Doerr. They applied edit distance to detect confusable drug names for the Food and Drug Administration. And they could point to examples where a patient got an in injection of Nakambut instead of the drug Nokorun and went into cardiac arrest. In other words, not just patients, but also medical professionals are confused by drug names sometimes. So they worked on that. Okay, so this was an example where our, our techniques from pr measuring pronunciation similarity in dialectology could be applied to practical problems. And I think that, that's very interesting, I think. Um, comprehensibility, of course, is a near neighbor in dialectology, it's been proposed as the key difference um, the, among dialects as opposed to related dialects as, as opposed to among related languages. The person who's worked on this the most is Charlotte Hoskins in Groningen, and sh they look at different linguistic levels, including the lexicon, syntax, um, uh, but, but also pronunciation, and, and, and also the um, non-linguistic uh, predictors. So those are things like the amount of experience that someone has had in a, using another language, the degree to which they like it, they also looked at. Those are the obvious ones. In particular, the amount of experience was always the big winner. Okay, but among the linguistic predictors, it was the overlap in lexicon and then overlap in pronunciation. And that was using the same edit distance technique that, that Charlotte had also been involved in working uh, with my group. I think I won't talk about mutual comprehensibility in the interest of time. I hope to get some questions. And I want to make sure I have time. Um, you all know that's not such a popular definition of dialects versus languages anymore, partly due to the asymmetry of the relation. I'm going to talk about sociolinguistics some more, but I'll just remind you that I've already shown that um, the dialect techniques can be useful in uh, social questions as well, that is the influence of age. But I'll go on to two others. So one is uh, work that my colleague in Freiburg, Peter Awa, has led, and that is he's looking at the way that the dialect landscape in Europe is being changed by mobility and education, and uh, I skipped a page, sorry. And he's, he's developed a model of this together with Franz Hinskins, in which they, they uh, say that the way to understand this is to think of a big cone where this is their model. The base dialects are, at, are here. The standard language is the peak of the cone, and what they call regiolects, I can't read that, I hope you can. 
uh, the regio lects should end up, with respect to the dialects, closer to the standard um, than, uh, than the, the base dialects themselves. That way you get a bit more comprehensibility and it's a bit, you still have some opportunity of identification. Okay, so we've looked at that and we tested the idea on radio, regional radio broadcasters in the Netherlands and Flanders. And what we found out was actually, and we show, I'm showing you here on the right, is that things did not work out so neatly. So um, here, you can't see that, but two of the radio broadcasters actually became less standard-like than the base dialect speakers. <laughs> In other words, these were people that really exaggerated. They wanted to sound really different, and they did. In fact, so different, they were you know, more, di more distinct from the standard than the base dialect speakers themselves were. And we used, the, as a base dialect speaker, we used the database we had, so it was a, a large number of speakers. And then there were some who um, were certainly different, but it wasn't such that um, there was a big benefit in understanding from it. They didn't actually get closer to the standard. They simply became more different. Not, not more distant from the, base di the, from the standard than the base dialects, but still not really oh, in a way that would help anyone. So, this, so I think there is room for this dialectic work in sociolinguistics. I'll just look at a couple of other uh, things that we've... Uh, looked at here. Um, maybe a good thing to note, however, is that in both cases um, it's been important to look at a fairly large amount of data um, um, involving a large number of linguistic properties. Okay. So it's, uh, I'm still, we're still not rivaling the dominant Lebovian school in sociolinguistics, which is trying to catch language change in progress, but there is a role, I think, for this sort of social study as well. Um, oh, is another, another um, this, is, this is interesting because it's closer to home. This was a study on uh, Catalonia, and it was the, we studied the effect of standardizing Catalan within Catalonia. So the, in, in an educational reform, the standard Catalan was introduced into the schools, and we had data from before that introduction into the schools and from after. And this is the, the picture on the right, is the overall picture that we get. And I include this with some malice of forethought because we could then compare it to three different individual uh, feature changes that had been studied individually by Rakassens, Massenelli, and by Romero. Two of the three pictures, namely the ones further on the right, match our aggregate picture, picture fairly well. Okay, so, so we're seeing in both cases in all three cases, we're seeing that Catalonia itself is becoming more standard-like. Um, Aragon, which is the next um, province over, um, is, is not advancing because it's not making use of that standard in Catalan. And the particular change that Rakassens looked at, which is the change in the, from the uh, palatal L, the Ella, to Ella, um, is not matching the overall pa pattern very well at all because it's, it's not being adopted in the north. I guess in Andorra, it's not being. So this is another case where I think we could contribute something um, in sociolinguistics, but again, based on a fairly massive change. That's maybe the key to the dialectometric e efforts. Jean uh, was a student of mine at Groningen and in, in, in some work that's just appearing now, he showed that you could detect work in uh, you could detect words that had been borrowed from one language into another from different, from one family to another. I should add that because it's the easy case in detecting loan words. These were cases where Turk, words from Turkic languages in Central Asia had been borrowed into Indo-Iranian languages or vice versa. It's not like um, Spanish and Catalan, right? Very, very close, very difficult to, to to see things there. Okay, and he, yeah, he showed that could have some uh, use there. I think this is a really interesting idea. The, the modern ideas in language contact, I'm thinking of Mufwini's ideas in particular, uh, are exciting to me as someone with the experience I have in, in dialectology. He emphasizes how free 
different mixtures can be. Right? I know I want to get beyond that as a linguist, but I think it jibes with my empirical feelings that that's the way things go. Another is measuring language profici proficiency. Uh, so this is Nathan Sanders and Chin measured the speech of speech proficiency of people who had a cochlear implant. Uh, people born deaf now almost always receive cochlear implants. Some of them are very uh, skeptical about it, but their parents, after all the decisions made when they're children, are almost always choose for the implant rather than living life as, as a deaf person. And he found that they could measure the differences in pronunciation well using the edit distance technique. And a, a younger colleague of mine, a Coronian, um, showed that you could measure foreign accented English using these techniques as well. That's a topic that comes up in language teaching and in lang both in what they call second language learning and in, for and, and in foreign language learning. It comes up in you know, all these areas where people are trying to acquire different languages. Finally, linguistic ge genealogy. Um, this is an interesting case that uh, uh, this is an interesting case, I think, because um, it's, I think it's an independent discovery. We used a very uh, data-intensive um, way of, of learning how to, uh, learning edit distance to detect cognates. And, and, oh, we used it for detecting dialect relatedness. Get Jaeger in uh, Tübingen uses it to detect cognates in historical linguistics. And he's actually using the same measure that we do, even down to the segment weightings that we use um, with a technique derived from information with theor theory. And, and it works quite well. Now, I want to go on to this last reflection where I promise to be a bit pro provocative. This a reflection on Chambers and Trudgill's synthesis. And their synthesis in brief is that variationist linguistics, their new term, is the fusion of dialectology and sociolinguistics. Okay, so I want to go on to that. Okay, first of all, these are two gentlemen that I admire. I think they've contributed a lot in suggesting we could do that. Um, we could look at this. But I think it's sociolinguistics of large-scale changes is largely is, is very interesting, I think. That's educational reforms, uh, regionalization due to, due to uh, mobility, et cetera. Okay. But the Lebovian sociolinguistics, in its, as it's mostly used, focuses on catching individual sound changes while changes are being uh, undergone. They seldom look at more than one phoneme. Sometimes they do, yes, I know, but the classic is then a small set of, of phonemes or, or vowels, anyway, that are that are behaving in somewhat the same fashion. Okay, and that's quite good. But it, in other words, the practice of sociolinguistics is very different from the dialectology that that we practice and love. That is, where we're interested in a very wide range of data. We're interested in working with a big data uh, data set. Okay. And I think if you reflect on this difference, that makes a lot of sense because after all, dialects are never, I'll say something daring, never characterized by a single change. Dialect differences, there are always dozens of changes. Right? So I, I think theoretically it makes sense to get beyond that sociolinguistic view that the focus on single changes is, is is going to be insightful for all areas of variationist linguistics. Uh, okay, so maybe that's a, a hasty general, has been a hasty generalization. That's what I'm suggesting. Okay. So dialects are accumulations of many differences, which perhaps all arose accompanied by social identifications. I'm not denying their leading premise that there's usually a social motivation. Um, but I, th this reflection suggests that, that the fusion they suggest might benefit from a complementary perspective that focuses not on individual differences in their social meaning, but rather on aggregate relations among varieties. That's, I'm convinced that's true of dialectology. And I'm convinced there are cases where 
social changes, social variation is better attacked from this broad perspective than from a narrow one. So it's uh, Mila Eska. That was my attempt at Basque. Uh, thank you for your patience, and I'm eager to hear your reactions. Bueno, Esker Milla, Esker Milla Zuri, eta orain galderetarako tarte badugu, amar bat minuto, inork galderarik egin nahi badu. Zakit eh, ordua gatik, ah. ah, or badal, galdera bat. Or rozio edo... Hemen. <laughs> right there. Well, well, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm uh, especially interested in the future the future feel the, I mean, uh, there was a PowerPoint slide where it was written uh, between the goals that uh, one of their goals was like four race into different fields. And so I'm especially interested in you uh, commenting which kinds of fields do you think that can be future uh, challenge for, for the actology or for linguistics in general. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to uh, elaborate on my overall theme. Um, the field that interests me a great deal right now is the field of language contact, um, perhaps because it's opening up a great deal. The f some of the others are, all, are already quite interesting. This field of language comprehensibility um, it's probably practically interesting because it affects things like educational programs. You, after all, don't teach um, Catalan to uh, Spanish speakers the same way you teach Catalan to American English speakers, right? You can count on an enormous shared vocabulary and things like that. Comprehensibility builds a lot on that. Uh, language context is very interesting, I believe, because it's, it's an enormous part of what happens in, in, shaping, mod, in la shaping languages over history. Contact has affected them massively. The, the handbooks on language contact, like uh, Kaufman and Thomason's beautiful book, or uh, von Kutzem's uh, also very excellent book, date from the 90s, and then they've, they really focused on this as a, as a kind of front door to uh, the study of diachronic linguistics or historical linguistics. And now what we're seeing is that contact is ruling out contact in, in, in studying hi historical linguistics is extremely difficult. And it needs you know, work on how to do this automatically and reliably. Say, starting with reliably. Can, uh, can we find ways, if not to detect it reliably, then at least to reliably verify hypotheses about contact. That would be an exciting thing. And I personally became interested in this when one of my graduate students, who I, I promised to mention and then didn't say much about, that is Bob Shackleton in 2010, looked at the English sources of American dialects. And that's where we looked at Mufweni's work on what happens in colonial varieties, which man, won't be so interesting, I guess, to the Basques, because I don't think there are Basque colonies anywhere but could be interesting to the Romanists because of all the Spanish colonies over the world. What's happened to Spanish in the Philippines or in uh, Latin America? That's a very interesting thing. And he, um, for example, has sketched how the first people to go into a new area have an inordinate influence. 
for the most part, we end up following the people that are there when we arrive. If, we, if you put yourself in the mind of a colonist and you're not the very first there, then you'll probably start copying the people that are there. Even as a name for this called the founder effect. And it, it is the same thing that happens when species move to islands. Huh? People don't believe it. Well, tell me why not, <laughs> if you want to. Sorry, my acoustic acuity at this moment is less than Microphone. optimal. Ah, here we go. No, so, sorry to interrupt. No, yeah. I was saying that I've read too much of Joan Bybee to oh, believe Bybee. in that. Yeah. So I'm more on Joan Bybee's side. Right. No, yeah, but Bybee's, uh, Bybee's work has shown how very frequent words tend to get um, tend yeah. to get borrowed. No, but she edited a, a monographic, I think, of linguistic typology precisely on the founder effect and all that. Oh, really? Oh, yes. okay. Oh, okay. I don't know the specific a answer. A whole bunch of typologists together. Okay. I'll give you the reference afterwards. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah. And you should all be correcting me because I've said lots of things about fields that I haven't done much work in, right? Just little bits. Professor Narbon, uh, I would like to know what's your your opinion about correlative dialectometry. Ah. Okay. So, yeah. So the question was, uh, what do I think about uh, correlative um, dialectometry? Is a term that Hans Goebel introduced um, to to explain what happens in uh, dialectometry um, uh, between different areas in particular, right? I'm trying to remember how he uses that term exactly. Now I'm asking you a question to answer yours. If it's about that, then of course it's interesting because lots of effects can be studied by finding the right contrasts and studying those, the right correlations. So. Talk to me more if, if I did not answer your question. Your face is telling me I did not. <laughs> yeah. Bueno, ikusten denez interesa piztu du, lehen asieran esan dugu bezala, azken galdera izanen da hau. Well, thank you again. Um, before you answer, that one of the main topics will be, or for you, will be language contact. And I was linking that idea to another idea you mentioned, that the University of Groningen um, has done some research about mutual intelligibility in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and is there any research relating language contact and how does it affect to mutual intelligibility in Europe? Like, for example, uh, language contact making it easier for people in Europe to understand other languages, not only because of their ling linguistic distance, but because of being, uh, being familiar to other languages. Like, for example, here in the Basque country, uh, Basque, French, and Spanish. For us, these three languages are more familiar than other ones, even if, for example, French and Spanish are not uh, typologically related to, to Basque. So is there any research that relates uh, language contact to mutual intelligibility? Um. Yes, is the, is the brief answer, and I can point to Charlotte Hoskin's work and two dissertations that have come out of that project. One uh, by, uh, by Svarta, uh, Femke Svarta, uh, and the other on, uh, by Jelena Golobovic on uh, Slavic. Originally in the planning there was to be something on romance as well, but they always, um, they did a, a very large uh, web-based 
uh, questionnaire and proficiency test. The questionnaire polled people on their backgrounds, including how much contact they'd had with the other languages. So if they were Czechs being, you know, ex we would have called Czechoslovakians 30 years ago, the Czechs, uh, how much uh, experience had they had with Croatian, or how much experience had they had with Bulgarian. So that was always part of the study. And that was, in fact, the single best predictor of how well they would understand that other language, the amount of experience that they'd had. There's, there's no question about it. It's probably because it re probably represents lots of variables, not just language ability in that, but also interest. I mean, after all, you don't have a lot of experience in another language unless you're somewhat interested in it. But yeah, she, it was always uh, used there. Yeah, and it's, it's in these dissertations. And they, she has a, a web page with a great summary of, of different papers, including summary papers you could start with anyway. Okay.